What we hope for is to be this infrastructure layer across payments and finance um, globally in a way that is agnostic to the different providers. We don't want to go build a lending product. We want to work with the best lending products. We don't want to go build a banking as a service product. We want to make the connectivity between payments and banking and uh, lending and all the other things seamless so that the software companies and others have the opportunity to choose their vendors of choice. Welcome to Bridges to Excellence podcast, inspired leadership in payments and fintech, bringing you conversations with payments, most fascinating people on top of their game, leaders, influencers, experts, and innovators. Each weekly episode turns our guests wisdom into practical advice. Their personal journeys are meant to inspire and challenge you to explore your possibilities. Here is your host, Desmond Nicholson. In this episode, part of our Founders series, we're talking to Todd Ablowitz, co-founder and co-CEO of Infinicept. Todd is a globally recognized authority on payment technology, mobile payments, and emerging trends. Todd founded Double Diamond Consulting in 2008 to help payments industry clients solve their most critical business challenges. Then in 2014, Todd, along with Dina Rich, co-founded Infinicept, making them both co-founders and co-CEOs. Infinicept provides tools and services that enable companies to get payments going their way. As a well-respected thought leader in the industry, investors, media, analysts, and industry watchers rely on Todd for expert advice, trend insights, and consulting. He has written articles and spoken about topics such as how embedded finance is changing the way financial services are delivered and why openness and transparency are good business. Since 2020, Infinicep has experienced exponential growth, tapping into the embedded finance market, which is projected to reach $585 billion by 2030. Todd will be taking us on his journey, perseverance, setbacks, dogged determination, transforming into the entrepreneur he has become. And of course, sharing with us along the way, insightful, actionable takeaways. So stay with us. Todd, welcome to our show. And do you realize it's been 27 years since we've known each other? 27 years. And uh, that was my pretty close to my first day in payments. Incredible, isn't it? Anyway, uh, we'll catch up later, okay? (laughs) Todd, take us back to your early life, where you grew up, and what your life was like while you were growing up. Oh, wow. I haven't had that question in a long time. I grew up in northern New York, about 20 miles as the crow flies from Canada, north of Lake Placid in a town called Potsdam. My dad was a professor, and still is, actually. And my mom was a real estate broker. I lived in a town that was a college town. Obviously, I was the son of a a college professor, and it was half college students and half farmers. And it was a great experience. Actually, really amazing public schools in Potsdam, New York. Amazing. And so I had a great education growing up. I wasn't a big fan of the uh, location and couldn't wait to get out of there and was lucky to do so when I was 16, moving to Boulder, Colorado. So uh, where did you attend school? Uh, university. I went to the University of Colorado at Boulder, go Buffs, and uh, very excited about our new football coach. We actually were a, uh, we were a national champion my sophomore year. We, had a, uh, we were a great football team during that time. So I wasn't a huge football fan until I got to Boulder, but That all changed. I went to school a little bit early. I went to school when I was 16. So that was an interesting experience. And what was your major in college? Well, it started pre-med. And after about a year of experiencing Boulder and all that Boulder has to offer, I switched majors to political science. Now, take us on your career path. Let's start out with first data. 
Yeah. Shall I, we? after spending an unusually long amount of time in college, I graduated in 96. And after I was screwing around all summer, I finally decided by around August that I really should like get a job and do something that would be productive. And a friend of mine that I'd worked with at a department store had been telling me about this job where he was selling credit card terminals. And he offered to introduce me to the manager and I sent a resume in, I got some letters of rec. I was very excited about this opportunity because he pumped it up so much. And I uh, put my clothes in the front seat of my two-seater car and drove down to Arizona and couch surfed with a friend and went in and got a, an interview at First Data with Scotty Wagner, who's a dear friend. In fact, I think he's coming next weekend to go skiing with me. But Scotty interviewed me on the way to the job interview. I, I drove it the day before because I really was excited about this job. And I, I, uh, I drove the route from my friend's house and it was a, a little ways and it was new. It was Arizona in August. And so I knew exactly how long it was going to take. I left really early uh, just to make sure I wouldn't take any chances with traffic since I didn't know it very well. And about halfway to the job interview, I got a flat tire in 108 degree weather uh, with a suit on. And I looked at the time and I said, there's no way AAA is going to get here on time. So I changed the tire in six minutes. And I remember getting to the front desk of Scotty's office and, uh, and the receptionist, Becky looked at me at, at, like I had three heads and I was, I sweat through my suit and it, luckily there was a gym underneath. And so I had enough time. I went down and I took a like I took a really quick shower and tried to like dry off my shirt and went into the interview. And by the time I got to the interview, he basically said I was hired. <laughs> and we ended up just talking about college basketball, I think. Oh, that's Scotty. Okay. Anyway, take us through that path beyond First Data, that first hire. Go ahead. I was at First Data for 10 years. Uh, so the first five years were selling or managing, mostly managing salespeople and training salespeople when I worked with you uh, to help small merchants with their payments experience. And uh, I realized very quickly within the first day that signing up a merchant account was like a mortgage, five pages in triplicate, press hard, three copies, voided check, drop of blood, firstborn child. It was nuts what we had to do to sign Kid up. and caboodle, as they would say. <laughs> yeah. And so really, I, it was exactly the opposite of my college experience. I just got really motivated. I thought it was a cool job and I really enjoyed it. And so I was fortunate enough to move up very quickly. It was a growth time at first aid. The late 90s were really a very uh, fast moving time. And before I knew it, I was managing something like half of the Wells Fargo um, merchant services sales team. And then I found myself in product uh, because that was kind of a disaster. Uh, and, and they asked me to clean that up. And so I spent that first five years was really in this sort of microcosm, this, this $300 million company called Wells Fargo Merchant Services that was a joint venture between First Data and Wells Fargo Bank, but it operated like its own entity. And it was really cool, great leadership, a lot of growth, a formative time. And then I moved into more of the mothership of First Data. And that second five years was a lot more stagnant, a lot more middle management as a director, uh, working for various executives on different pro product initiatives. And there was a lot of seasoning on things like um, learning how to speak to executives. I was really terrible at it uh, for a long time and it got beaten into you how you needed to do it. We, one of my uh, most important mentors was uh, Diane Vogt, who's now Diane Faro. And she, uh, man, she was tough as nails and uh, really uh, set a very, very high bar that was difficult. I thought she hated me. <laughs> We've talked about this. Since. I thought she absolutely hated me because she's just really tough. And I remember when I, uh, it was time for me to go after 10 years and I got recruited to go to a Silicon Valley company. I'll talk about that in a minute. I remember giving notice and I was terrified to tell Diane. He, she, her assistant thought I was like sick or going to tell her I had cancer or something. It sounded so bad. So I finally tell her. And then we did a conference uh, to kind of do, we were doing the National Association of Convenience Stores Conference. At that time, I, I had 7-Eleven and some really big um, relationships across First Data. And 
I remember I gave her notice. We did some turnover with the customers. And then she and I sat down at a blackjack table and started talking and playing blackjack. And we became best friends. I had no idea how she felt about me. And, and we ended up, after I left First Data, we became really good friends. And to this day, she's one of my dear, dear friends. Okay, great. And what's the next step after that, after First Data? So in those days, this is 2005. And okay. There was a lot of excitement about contactless payments. And I went to a company that built the best contactless payments readers in the world. They were called Vivotech. And we built contactless payment readers about 10 years, it turns out, before anyone needed them. Uh, but Visa and MasterCard were populating them into the marketplace. And uh, during the time I was there, I was VP of sales. Uh, so I ran global sales there. And I think we sold... 750,000 readers in 29 countries during the three years I was there. And uh, what an experience. My networking, when you're inside First Data, at least in those days, it's very insular. We knew each other, but we didn't work with that many outside companies in a lot of the jobs, either customers or colleagues. And uh, Vivotech was the exact opposite. I had to meet the top brass from every single uh, merchant acquirer, not only in the US, but many of them around the world with a focus on the US. And I was fortunate during that time to be elected to the board of the Electronic Transactions Association in 2008. And that was really incredible. I'd been involved by then, I'd been involved in the organization for about eight years. I'd been the uh, vice chair and then the chair of the technology committee. And that was a huge way for me to get to know people in the industry, make a difference. We started the technology innovation award when I was chair of the tech committee. And that, that lives on to this day. We really wanted to do something that would endure. So anyway, I uh, was able to broaden my network during those three years. And then what ended up happening was you may have heard that there was a minor financial disturbance in 2008. And uh, that really put a bullet in Visa and MasterCard populating the readers. So when you when you need to get acceptance of a new payment modality, you have to drive acceptance so that when someone gets issued the card, they can use it. And so Visa and MasterCard stalled on their acceptance drive in the US because of the recession and budgets and whatnot. And so that really put pressure on VivoTech. And, and I got fired, well, laid off, whatever you call it, because it was my fault that that happened. I, I joke about that. Of course. Um, but really cherished that time. I worked with another mentor of mine, Mohammed Khan, they call him now the godfather of NFC, which is the broader technology around contactless. And I learned more from Khan. He was a software engineer who learned how to do sales and business development. And I learned more from that man than I can possibly tell you. Okay, and let's not downplay this. In 2010, you were awarded a member of the year at ETA, okay? Now, it's, a great it's a great organization. I'm sure I'll talk about it again during the course. Sure. Then, of course, you got into or you founded Double Diamond. What was that about? So when I left VivoTech, when I left, I was still consulting with them for a long time. I left on really good terms. I love to joke about how it went down. But I, I always wanted to start a company. And I didn't really consider consulting, starting a company, but it was like a, it was all I knew I could do. It's the only idea I had at the time. So I First thought, step. yeah. And I thought, I know a lot of people and I made a bet that people would pay for the, the we didn't sell VivoTech readers because of they had more Hertz or more, I don't know, power on this or that. VivoTech readers beat the competition because we weren't selling readers. We were selling what these things could do what contactless would mean over time, how it could change a retailer's business. And so we built that understanding and that vision of the future. And I thought, I think people will pay for that. So I actually started doing some consulting work with a couple companies. And I also started looking for a job because I didn't have much money. I had moved back to Colorado. Fortunately, I hadn't sold my house in Colorado and I only rented in California when I was out there. But when I moved back, I was really, really tight. And actually, my wife at the time had, didn't have a job. We had a one-year-old. And so we had like emergency funds only. So in addition to starting Double Diamond Group, 
I also went and was having serious conversations about the job and I got an offer uh, to go back to First Dayton. And it was a lot of money. It was like double what I'd made when I left. And it was a lot more than I was, you know, pulling down in consulting. And I just, I had one big opportunity on the line from POS Portal. I knew the CEO quite well, Buzz Stryker. And he and I had been talking about a project. And I said to him, look, I've got an offer. I'd really like to do this consulting thing, but I need an anchor client. I need to know that I have some, a certain amount. I, and I needed, at the time, I knew if I had $50,000 of committed business over the next six months, that I could build around that. And so he came back to me. I was on a plane. I think we were using those, I think it was Blackberries because I, I can see the, the text in my, in my head. And he said, I'll let you know by the time you land back in Denver, I was actually pitching a consulting gig. And so I'm landing in Denver and I get a text saying, confirmed 50,000 in consulting business in the next six months. And I went back and I talked to Heidi and I said, look, I've got this offer for a lot of money to go back to First Data and I've got this anchor client. And she said, well, what do you want to do? And I said, I think that the consulting business is, has legs. And she was good with it. And that was that. And I turned down the First Data offer and took the gig and I ended up making more that first year. It, it worked well even that first year. Great. It is now 2014. Infinicept is launched. How was the idea conceived, leading to adopting embedded payments as a viable business model? Walk us through that light bulb moment. Okay. So it's actually before that. Uh, we, I was on the board of ETA, and I made friends with this lady who was really smart on risk, fraud, compliance. And the thing that really stood out about Dina, this is now my co-founder, the thing that stood out about Dina was there was a conversation about risk. And one of the industry's icons, uh, Deborah Rossi, was talking about very aggressively in her inimitable style. She was very aggressively talking about a particular topic, something to do with chargebacks. And Dina, in the most elegant way, corrected her on how it really worked and did it in a way that was elegant, respectful, and captivated the room, including Deborah. And she stood out big time. So we became friends and we were talking. Another meeting or two later in April 2011, Visa and MasterCard came in and said the same day, they would do their own presentation. They were like Chinese walled off. So Visa would come in and leave. And MasterCard would come in and then leave and the other card brands. And they both on the same day announced rules for what we now call payment facilitators. And I was captivated by that. I thought that was unbelievable. And I went and talked to the visa guy, um, Samir Govel, and asked him, I said, is it, is it as big as it seems like it is? And he says, I think it's, it's huge. And I said, I'm going to go focus my business on this. So I grabbed Dina and I was like, hey. She was like, I was thinking the same thing. I, there's so much compliance risk and challenges to the models like this, it's a great opportunity. So we put our heads together, said, okay, we'll do some gig work. And so we each had consulting companies. So Dina had a rich consulting. And by the way, you should put her on. She's unbelievable uh, for this podcast. Absolutely. I absolutely recommend it. So Dina uh, and I agreed to do some work. And within a month, we get a call. I get a call from a company called DevPay. And they wanted to build payments for developers. And they, and I called Dina. I was like, hey, do you think you can help these guys? Because they need to figure out how to get approved at Wells Fargo. They were in Y Combinator, uh, which is a startup incubator. And so we helped them. I think they had nine employees. They got approved at Wells Fargo. Um, and then somewhere in there, they changed their name to Stripe. And mm. so we found ourselves working with what became one of the most famous startup stories ever. And then a few customers later, Dina gets a call on a referral. She'd done a lot of work with Google and this company called Shopify called Dina on a referral from Google. And they said, we want to create Shopify payments. 
And Dina calls me and says, Hey, there's a whole bunch of cool stuff here. You know, I've got some of it, but I'd love to get your expertise on some of it. And so we helped launch Shopify payments. And that was, they had about 20,000 merchants at the time on 17 different payment gateways. And we helped them figure that all out and get Shopify launched. And the CFO who hired us at the time uh, is still on our advisory board, as is Samir Govel and, and one of my mentors from First Data. Uh, I think you had him on your podcast, Yul Adams. Great. Now, tell us about some of the major hurdles you encountered in getting Infinicep off the ground and how you feel it strengthened Infinicep as a company. Well, the first thing was you talked about 2014. The first thing right. was uh, pivoting from just consulting to having some software. We had, we worked with a uh, software company that needed the software and we ended up partnering with them and, and they had a percentage of the company. We then were trying to sell it, but we didn't really have much yet. And so 2014, 2015, 2016, all those years were just kind of long proofs of concept because we didn't want to raise money. We wanted to bootstrap. And as we finally got some early software to the plate and we were demoing it, I think I gave 300 demos before we made a dollar. And we showed it to this guy, Henry Helgeson, who was the founder and CEO of Cayenne, which is a huge payments company, sold for a billion dollars later to Tesis. He said, look, I'm busy with some things right now, so I can't buy your software, but I'd love to invest. And so the first thing, Dina and I looked at each other and said, we're bootstrappers, but we know and trust Henry. And the first hurdle was the hurdle of taking other people's money. But that's what got us off the ground. And we, we raised some money from Henry. And then he brought a couple of friends in that are industry icons uh, in the investing world and hiring those first few people. And then um, there have been so many hurdles. Uh, this one might take a minute. We getting from you know, the first couple of people to around when we, as we got to about six people, we had to start having meetings. And I mean, most of the people that worked for us were quite a bit younger than us and used to a, an asynchronous engineering culture. And we were losing the thread some of the time by not talking ever. And so we had to start doing meetings and that was interesting. And then throughout 2018, we were building for a few customers. We signed up five customers by the end of 2018, and we needed to raise some more money. So I did a pass the hat round uh, for payment CEOs and investors and working our networks. And it was all just people we knew. And nobody that invested in Finisep until 2022 uh, wow. did we go to. They all came to us. They all said, we, we like what you're doing. Can we invest? And we finally put a round together in end of 2018. And we had about six employees uh, and we went to 40 employees in 2019. So that next hurdle was unbelievable torrid growth and figuring out a way to do that. And I remember in July, 2019, we'd sold all these customers. We went from five customers to 30 in wow. a year. And I remember some of those early customers, when you're building new software, you have to make promises of, well, we need this. If, you know, for us to buy the software, we have to have this widget. And so any one of those things wasn't very hard. But when you stack that on top of each other, it creeps up on you. So whenever starting something, I really recommend keep a lid on the early growth. Don't go too far too fast because it can really be hard unless you're ready to raise an enormous amount of money. So that next hurdle was the software falling over uh, with real customers that needed to pay merchants. And you know, late nights and, and fixing it barely and uh, being able to get there and keeping the customers, we didn't have anyone leave, but it was really, really hard because they trust you to buy your software. They trust you on delivering. And when you are doing your best, but have trouble, it's really difficult. There's so many more hurdles. I mean, we had COVID, we had uh, SVB, uh, which was our big investor in 22, when they went under that, you know, we didn't know where our money was. I mean, we've had hurdle after hurdle after hurdle and probably we'll have some more. Now, how many funding rounds have you completed so far? So I think technically, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, technically five. The first four rounds mm -hmm. were all very small and, and a small number of people and all common stock. We've only had one preferred round, Series A, 
And that was April of 22. Now, what is the mission of Infinisip? And why is Infinisip an asset to the payment fintech industry? So our mission is to drive the transformation to software-led payments. That's our mission. We want to drive software companies to the fore of the payment ecosystem. So the biggest reason we're an asset to the payments in fintech space is we believe in openness, transparency, fairness, integrity, and that's not been the history in electronic payments, unfortunately. We started something called the Embedded Payments Bill of Rights. You can look at it. It's embeddedpaymentsbillofrights.com. And this is a industry movement with eight principles around things like I mentioned, transparency, fair pricing, no lock-in. And so the biggest thing that Infinicept stands for and provides is the ability to interoperate with your choice of technology, your choice of bank, your choice of software ecosystems. And we bring democracy to the software companies and help them. They, I mean, soft, think about it. Software companies are incredible. They come up with an idea. Maybe it's in event management, or maybe it's in restaurants. Maybe it's in nonprofits and they go and they build this beautiful merchant experience, business experience that ties so many different elements of what a business, whether it's a nonprofit or a restaurant or, or event management or government payments, these software companies build this thing. They get it distributed. They answer the questions. They build it so that it's user-friendly. They do all this stuff. But then when it came time for payments, they were just tossing it to some other company with a clunky process. And that other company so many times did not serve the customer the kind of experience that the software companies can serve. So the software companies are rightfully in front of this. The software companies are rightfully the ones to take payments to the next level. What we do that's special is we help them get there faster. We help them get there more seamlessly. And we help them get there without locking them into some closed ecosystem. Got you. Now, let's talk about a customer. You could pick any customer who has become a payment facilitator on top of your platform. Let's focus on use case scenario and talk about the before and after. Yeah. One of my favorite customers is a company called Workwave. Workwave has the majority market share in field service management for recurring services. So for example, the so-called green industries, that's pest control, lawn care, they have janitorial services, et cetera. So they were in a referral agreement with a major processor. The customers were complaining. They had a statement that said the processor's name. The revenue share was paltry. The pricing was, was totally opaque. And it was just overall a terrible experience for their customers. So they decided to become a payment facilitator. They had some bumps in the road before they chose us. They worked with another vendor, uh, who shall remain nameless, and they tried. But they had a financial plan to hit a certain amount of revenue. And when they found us and they tried to launch, but nothing worked. And when they found us in the fall of 2019, they were in a tough spot. And I remember when we finally were getting close to signing an agreement, keep in mind, we just gotten from five summers to 30. Mm -hmm. And they were the last agreement we signed before COVID. And when the CEO called me and said, I want to do a top to top, I want to make sure. He also wanted to grind me down for a better price. He said, can you hit this plan of March, uh, March uh, getting a material amount of volume going and by November having the entire 
portfolio live. And I committed that we would get it done to him. Um, they got it done throughout 2020. They got live and, uh, and they hit their financial plan. Post that experience, they have a totally WorkWave branded experience. Customers deal with nobody but WorkWave. They're on our tech. The customer is looking at a screen that is controlled by Infinisat, both on the merchant application and the submerchant portal, which is what the merchants see. They see the WorkWave logo and mm -hmm. they see all their transactions. But it is totally a WorkWave experience. Infinisep doesn't exist other than in a URL. And now WorkWave has grown their portfolio by 4x wow. since they started. They're making significant income and their merchants love it. They added ACH. They've got check conversion or it's not conversion. What do you call it? Re check deposit, remote uh, check deposit. They've been doing things with finance and it's all on WorkWave Payments, which is a, a really an admirable example. I don't, I won't give their volume. I don't know if they talk sure. about it publicly, but it is billions and billions of payments volume. You. Excellent. What are Infinisep core values and how are they reinforced in the workplace? So we have five core values and we talk about them all the time. They're extremely important to us and everything we do revolves around our core values. So the first one is have integrity. The second one is do the right thing. The third one is act like an adult. The fourth one is be excellent because perfect is impossible. And the fifth one, everyone's favorite, is eat and drink well. The way we re reinforce these, Des, they are infused into everything we do. So let's just take an example. We are into a ton of autonomy. Engineers are expected to do their job and produce and, and create pull requests for their code. And the reason we give them autonomy is we expect people to act like an adult. And guess what? If you treat people like an adult, they're more likely to act like an adult. Do the right thing. So this one's really important. Do the right thing. It, it's just everything from when we've had challenges in the company, when we've, um, had people with personal challenges. When we think about how we treat our customers, we come back to, okay, well, what's the right thing here? It might be painful. It might be um, costly or difficult. We just say, do the right thing. The one that I think is most important, I wouldn't say it's my favorite because it might be the hardest, but it is the most important is be excellent because perfect is impossible. And what that means to me is so often we find ourselves, at the first part, sure, be excellent. That's easy, right? You should really be excellent. Great. Well, perfect being impossible is really important because we don't want people covering their ass. We don't want people saying, well, the reason I did this thing was because I thought this and I thought that. And I was thinking, it doesn't matter. If you made a mistake, you made a mistake. You're not perfect. Let's just get that right there in the middle of the table. I fucked up. I do it all the time, multiple times a day. And putting that out there and saying, let's be transparent that we screwed up on something. It's fine. Let's own it. Let's not get into a whole bunch of noise around why it wasn't really a screw up or covering up that it was, we just screwed up. It's fine. People do it like multiple times a day. So that one's really important to me personally. Yeah because I find myself, if I'm trying to be perfect, defensive, and that has, there's no room for that in life or in business, we should just recognize that we're fallible and we got to just keep getting better. Absolutely. Now, transparency is one of the key pillars in building a strong culture in your organization. What kind of feedback mechanism you have in place to make it work? Well, it's, it's infused in everything we do. So we have regular communication. We are transparent with our financials, we're transparent with how the business is going, whether it's going well or at that particular time, not going so well. We're transparent about our new sales. We're transparent about how many employees are doing what, uh, changes in the organization, everything. And one of the ways we communicate um, 
is through uh, a monthly all hands. And we haven't asked me anything. Dina and I and our chief operating officer, Scott Agutep, usually have a, a set agenda, but especially with Scott taking over as COO, he runs a lot of the operations of the company um, and he'll walk through the agenda, but we always leave enough time for Ask Me Anything. And we put vehicles out there for people to ask um, by voice, by chat, anonymously. And we've got checks and balances to make sure that it's really anonymous. And we get all kinds of interesting and tough questions and we don't, we don't shy away from them. And that kind of transparency has built a culture. And look, we, we always can get better and, and we always encourage our employees to tell us how to be better. But I believe that the employee base trusts us uh, to do the right thing, trusts us to tell them the truth and be transparent. And that's because we've done so in good times and bad. Our, one of our, we have some, we, on podcasts like this, we talk about so many things, but one of the principles that's really important is employees come first. If you treat your employees really well, they will treat your customers really well. And if your customers are really happy, your investors get taken care of. So I think American business culture has gotten that upside down too many right. times. And I just think that if we just do our basic job every day, then the investors will get taken care of. I guess it's that employee first mentality. Absolutely. And it shows, case in point, in January, Infinicep was honored by Built-in as their 2023 Best Place to Work Awards, ranking 15th on the best mid-sized places to work, Colorado. Congratulations. Thanks, Des. As uh, co-CEOs, how do you and Dina divvy up your responsibilities? That is such a great question. I have to tell you, I was not a believer in co-CEOs before we, before we met. I, I thought, well, there's one president. How are you going to have two bosses? Like, who, how do you break ties? Who's going to do what? And it turns out in that time during 2019, where everything was going really quickly, we were stepping all over each other. Not in a bad way. Our trust and commitment to our partnership is unparalleled. I've never seen anything like it. She, she's ride or die in terms of a business partnership. And we found ourselves making decisions that the other person had made the opposite decision or just stepping all over each other. Because when we were just partners, we just talked about stuff and made decisions. So we hired a coach, a professional coach, to help us through, like, okay, how do we divvy it up? And we became extremely uh, precise and specific about who does what. And basically, I do go to market and Dina does fulfillment. So I looked after everything from marketing, demand gen, business development, sales. At the beginning, that included product. And then Dina looked after engineering, consulting, customer support. Oh, I also had customer success in those days. And then Dina looked after customer support and, and all of the serving of the demand that was, that was generated. And then, then we evolved. We realized that keeping product and engineering on opposite sides was not healthy for the company. So we moved product to where it belonged uh, in Dina's organization. Then we brought in a CTO to run all that for Dina. And then most recently, Scott coming in as COO, he's taken over everything except for sale at the CTO organization with sales reports to me, CTO reports to Dina, and uh, everything else reports to Scott. Good. Um, my next question, but before I get into that question, let me put some context to it. There you were in 1996, fresh out of college no prior work experience. You joined First Data in sales. Within three years, it's now 1999, you are now a district sales manager for Wells Fargo Merchant Services Alliance, covering Colorado, Utah, and Nevada, et cetera. In that same year, you were nominated for your first leadership award that I'm aware of, namely First Data's Leaders of the Pack Award, recognizing employees whose performance were exceptional and exemplary. With that being said, Todd, when you think about your journey as a leader, do you think you were born with these capabilities and capacity? Or do you think you really learned to become a leader during the course of your career? 
It is not a close call. Absolutely 1000% learn. I was such a dork when I got started. I was a micromanager. I didn't know what I was doing. I compensated with it for it with hard work, but yeah, I was, I was terrible. And I give the credit to all kinds of leaders that I worked with Scott Wagner, George Jathis, Bill Vokdal, you and Karen Whalen uh, taught me an enormous amounts about how to, how to carry oneself in a public domain and how to lead. And, uh, and there's many, many more. I mentioned uh, Diane Faro, uh, Brian Symes, Charles Drucker. I mean, it's endless, right? You just go through these people that you learn so much from. And so I absolutely studied and listened and was made a very strong attempt to be self-aware and not be so proud that I thought I knew what I was doing at 23 years old, you know, starting in corporate America. Now, how would you describe your leadership style? I would say, I think it'd be better to hear from the team for this, but the best I can say is I listen word. I strive to give both autonomy and accountability to my team and try not to get in their way. I'm very passionate about the vision though, where I have been accused of being overly micro is when I have a particular way that I see the company evolving and I don't see alignment to that. Very, very, very important to me. And I think the most important thing is developing people. My dad is, I mentioned earlier, is a professor and he talks about scientific children and scientific grandchildren. And one of the most rewarding times that I heard about was when one of my managers, Steve Moss, who I still adore to this day, I think he's one of the top brass at Wells Fargo still, he was talking about someone that he had developed and that person had done some amazing things and he was really encouraged to see their career blossoming. And I think of that example where you've developed someone and then they go on to develop someone and, they, and you're passing down this business leadership through the generations, uh, metaphorically speaking. So that, that's really, I think, a great way to, to look at how to be a good leader. Now, over the years, CEOs and business leaders have shared their thoughts on the phrase work-life balance. What does that mean to you? Or would you phrase it differently? Yeah, um, I think everybody's got to, I think you got to do you on these things. And, and it changes throughout your story arc. One of the things that I realized at the end of my tenure at First Data is I'd let my body fall apart. And I was not feeling it at, what was I, 33 or something. I was not happy with how my body performed. And it was hard to fix that too much. I started fixing it in California with VivoTech, but it really put attention to it in, starting in 2008 when I started Double Diamond Group. I had more time on my hands and I made it a priority. And one of the big priorities for me was to get back to skiing. Double Diamond Group is a play off of a Double Diamond, uh, which is a black, double black diamond ski run. And I really prioritized skiing and um, personal health. And of course I had little ones. So as they started to come in, that took a lot of attention. And I thought in that, in those consulting days, that lifestyle business I had, I, a lot of times I would go skiing on Fridays and I would spend time with my kids and they became really great skiers. And one of my great joys is skiing with them. So it became a very heavy period of the life part of work, so-called work, work-life balance. And then when Dina and I started Infinisap, I mean, a startup is, all, it's all encompassing. You don't have a life of anything. So that's a 90, a hundred hour a week job at times. And for some years, like it was for consistent time. And so some of the work-life balance, so-called work-life balance was more work and a little less life, but you have to keep your body together. If I didn't run a marathon in 2013, if I didn't um, work out in a, in a consistent basis, and most importantly, getting my skiing in, I wouldn't be effective in my work. Good. What are some of Infinicept's growth initiatives for the coming year? Okay. Our biggest initiative is we found over the last few years where our approach to be a software company for payment facilitators and other payments companies, too many software companies just don't feel they're ready to be a payfac. 
no matter how much we can make the case and show them, hey, this is, you can do this, especially with our help, they just didn't feel they were ready. And a lot of our competitors were payfax themselves and just said, let us do the payments for you. And that never jived with our values until we realized that we could do it in a way that was really friendly to the software companies. So we created LaunchPay. LaunchPay launched earlier this year in Stealth, and then we announced it in September. And LaunchPay is a payment facilitator for software companies that aren't quite ready. And so we'll do the payments for you. You still get your branding. You still do the sales. You can still service your customers, but you don't have to register and learn everything about payments when you're paying back. Good. Now, what are you most excited about in Finisip's future? I can't believe how quickly people are adopting LaunchPay. We've got billions and billions and billions signed up already. Our legacy product, the PayOps payment operations software, we have about 15 billion annualized payment volume. And we signed up more than a third of that in six months on LaunchPay. It's going to take some real hard work to get all the merchants live and to do all the gritty stuff to make that volume come true, but the early excitement about the product is staggering. Now, where do you see the company in five years down the road? I think anybody who answers that question with a straight face is fooling themselves. Our ambition and what we hope for is to be this infrastructure layer across payments um, globally in a way that is agnostic to the different providers. We don't want to go build a lending product. We want to work with the best lending products. We don't want to go build a banking as a service product. We want to make the connectivity between payments and banking and uh, lending and all the other things seamless so that the software companies and others have the opportunity to choose their vendors of choice. Now, what keeps yeah. Todd up at nights? Yeah, I think anyone who's in electronic payments that doesn't think about data security, it, it doesn't have their eye on the ball. But I think the biggest thing I think about is, you know, we have more than 60 families at Infinicept. And the thing that I think keeps me up the most at night is making sure that we do the right things, make the right decisions and bring the business where it needs to go to make sure that those families can thrive and achieve their objectives. And part of that is your job and your financial uh, wherewithal. What aspect of your personality do you think has been the most helpful in your career, Todd? I think kindness. I think uh, I have always tried to be there for people and uh, it's paid back way more than I would have imagined. And I want to double down on that. The law of reciprocity, indeed. Now, fintech is one of the hottest areas of innovation right now. Where do you see opportunities and where would you steer new entrepreneurs to look for problems to solve? Well, within payments, I get very excited about Payfact, of course. If I wasn't doing Payfact, I think one of the areas that's super exciting is network tokens and orchestration. I think uh, business to business payments is a hundred trillion dollar opportunity worldwide, something like 30 trillion in the U S so I get very excited about that. Healthcare payments are still messed up. Just paying your doctor should be so much easier beyond payments. I think the broader embedded finance opportunity is huge. The thing I'd caution there is it's so big. One has to find a niche to address it. So it is addressable. Trying to, to bite off a $585 billion market in one fell swoop doesn't work. All the great opportunities started with some sort of niche and use that as a jumping off point to build and expand to additional. Good. Okay, we now move into our final segment. The Lightning Round, Bridges to Excellence, Inspired Leadership in Payments and Fintech. Todd, in this segment, I pose a question and you respond with a single word or one sentence. Shall we begin? Let's go. 
the road not traveled. Irrelevant. Introvert or extrovert? Massive extrovert. What does success mean to you? Changing payments. What is the best advice you ever received? Follow nature. What one book would you recommend to our listeners and why? The Mind-Body Prescription by Dr. John Sarno. The reason is the connection between the mind and the body is little understood. When he was alive, nobody accepted his uh, research, even though he was a tenured professor at New York University. And today, he died a few years ago, and today his work on tension myositis syndrome has changed pain management. So uh, the mind-body prescription is the best book I've ever read. Good. What is your favorite quote in leadership or otherwise that inspires you? You can build trust for 20 years and lose it in 20 seconds. Bingo. That was, that was a quote that Mohammed Khan uh, that I mentioned earlier in the podcast said to me. What is one thing people you work with would be surprised to learn? I'm kind of an open book, so I got to think about it. I was a giant dork in high school and a complete nerd. Who is your hero of all times and why? My dad. I knew um, you would have said that. Because he, uh, he is 78. He is a distinguished professor at University of Colorado, still actively teaching. He will probably into his 80s won the biggest award that you can win at CU, the biggest faculty award, and he's hilarious. Broncos or Raiders? Broncos. Or <laughs> real. What is one thing that has you fired up right now? Taylor Swift. Todd, it's been great catching up with you. And thanks for the invaluable insights and sharing your journey. And for that, we're grateful. Any parting thoughts to share or comments before we wrap up? I just want to say thank you for everything you taught me and for the time we spent together all those years ago. I use the things I've learned from your coaching and tutelage uh, to this day. Well, thank you, my friend, for being on our show. And to our listeners, as always, thank you for your time. And Todd, do give my regards to Dina, will you? Will do. And never forget, the more you expect from yourself, the more you excel. You've been listening to Bridges to Excellence podcast, inspired leadership in payments and fintech. Be sure to join us next time for more conversations with another of your colleagues in payments and fintech. Insightful conversations in their journey to excellence. For transcripts and other materials covered on the show, visit us at DesmondNicholson.com.